Hey, I'm going to show you how to implement a custom chip to include in digital simulations using Walkwee from A to Z. And I mean, we'll go through the data sheet, try it out in real life, build a test circuit in the sim, code it up, and then try that out. In the last video, I whooshed over the concept by flying through three examples implementing custom chips. That's a nice way to get a preview of the ways you can easily integrate any IC into your simulations, but it was, let's say, rapid fire. Today, I'm going to reduce the pace a bit and walk through a complete implementation from datasheet to testing and spend more time on the particulars, decisions, and techniques used as well as the reasoning behind them. Now, the first thing we need is a goal. I covered a bit of SPI last time, and here I wanted to look at implementing an I2C chip. There are tons of these, but I found an interesting use case, the PCF8575 IO Expander. A few reasons for this choice are, it's a useful IO Expander and not yet another LED thing. Uh, the interface is I2C and surprisingly simple. It has address bootstrap pins, so we can have many of these on the same bus. It's from a family of chips, so we might be able to reuse this code for other ICs, namely the uh, 8574. And it's different from many IO Expanders in interesting ways, as we'll see. Okay, here's the four step plan. We'll go through the data sheet and figure out how this thing works. We'll decide on a good way to demo and test it. We'll play with the real thing a bit uh, to make certain the behavior is actually understood. And finally, with all that, we can build out the SIM circuit and implement the custom chip a piece at a time and get it running in simulation. So let's have a seat and take a peek at the data sheet for this guy. Yeah. Got the PCF8575 data sheet here. Uh, let's see what we can find out. So of course it's an I2C device, as we said, <laughs> like that. Uh, there's an open drain interrupt output, so that's interesting. I'm not too sure how to do that. Um, it's addressed by three hardware address pins, so we can have uh, like eight devices on one bus, so that's cool, and it'll let us play with that. There's some interesting stuff here. A 16-bit quasi-bidirectional input output. Okay, and then they say each quasi bidirectional IO can be used as an input or output without the use of a data direction control signal. So that's different and interesting. The chip is set up just as you'd expect. Uh, basically, you've got the I squared C lines and the interrupt, the address pins here, and two ports. And so they call them P0001, 0, 0, 0, 0, and then 101, 0, 1, so it's port one, pin zero, port one, pin seven. Well, let's try and figure out what they mean by uh, the, the quasi bidirectional stuff. Yeah, let's take a look at, uh, at what's on the inside here. This stuff on the left here, uh, these flip-flops are basically memory. Uh, the top one looks like it's remembering what you set it to, and the bottom one is remembering uh, what it read. Okay, so let's focus on the output for now. This is the pin itself, and um, so these two FETs here, this guy and this guy, are opposite polarity, and they're fed by the same gate. So only one can be on at a time, right? So uh, let's say that this guy is on here. Well, in that case, this guy doesn't exist. It's like an open switch, right? So that means that this output is basically tied to ground. Okay, so that's one case. And the other case is this guy's off, so he's like an open switch, and this guy is on. And he's tied, well, he's not quite tied. He's, there's a current source here that's 100 milliamps. So it looks like, from this pin's perspective, uh, it could be driving some LED or something like that. Ah, there you go. Okay, if it's like this and current is being uh, sourced here, if you pull it low, then this path comes in here. Pop. So anytime a read pulse comes in, this flip-flop remembers what that was and it spits it out to you. It tells you what that what's happening. And if it's different than what it remembered at any point, then this happens and the interrupt goes on. Okay, that's pretty interesting. So the final thing would be what this looks like in terms of protocol. Okay, this is the address bit stuff. Uh, if they're all low, it says it's hex 40, but if you look at this, there you go. Yeah, it's hex 40, zero, one, Nah, 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 zeros, uh, but that's the full eight bit. That means that we shift it by one for the, you know, for most libraries, it'll be hex 20, the base address. Okay, uh, but the important thing is you always send two bytes, so it's data, data, 
Oh, and it's P05 here, P06, P07. So the low port, the zero port is first, the first byte that comes in, and then the second byte is port 10 to port 17. Okay, so that was a write. Reads are just the same. They they actually don't say which which port this is. They just say pin one zero one two three four five six seven zero one. But I mean, it, it's going to be the same thing. Okay, so I think I get this. I'll take a deeper look and uh, try and summarize it uh, sanely. Okay, so if I'm getting this right, you send over two bytes to configure the 16 pins as either where they're just uh, tied to ground, so they're low outputs and you definitely do not want to short them to BCC, or high, where they can push out current and act as a high output, uh, and at the same time could be pulled low externally and read as inputs that either report high or low. Reading two bytes will give you zero for each bit that uh, is either set low or set high and pulled low, and one for each bit that's set high and not pulled low. Huh. The open drain interrupt acts like a switch to ground that closes whenever there's a change to input uh, since the last read or write. And this interrupt will stay that way until you either read write to the device or the change since the last interaction with the device goes away and it reverts back to its original state, meaning plop plop, sorry, you missed that event. Finally, the address pins act as usual, basically setting the last three bits of the slave address. So before we start, let's think about what the open questions are at this point and how we're going to test the custom chip. The two things I'm wondering right now are, did I understand all that correctly? And can I actually implement that open drain interrupt output with Walkwe? I've never done it, so I wanna see if and how we can include an open drain output. In theory, this is a pin that acts as either uh, tied low to ground or is just floating. So that'll be simple to try out and verify. Informed by that, we'll be ready to implement the custom chip. Now, what will be our test? I'm gonna to wanna to see four things. Uh, using some pins as outputs, using some pins as inputs, monitoring the uh, interrupt pin, and uh, using those address bits. When we can see all those are behaving well, we'll call it done and say we've got a decent custom chip model of the PCF8575. Now, before I code anything, I want to make sure uh, I'm modeling a real behavior. So we're actually going to try it out on a real chip. I ordered a few of these PCF8575s, and as you can see, they're SMD components. You could always stick this on a breakout board, but if you play with a lot of chips, it's really nice to have a few uh, ZIF sockets to breadboard adapters like this. You can then just pop it in there uh, without any putzing around and start playing right away. I'm also gonna need some pull-ups for the I2C lines, open drain outputs, uh, LEDs, so I just pre-tinned some pins on the standard 100 mil header and use a few 1206 resistors, which fit really nicely with this. I find this is a great way to have a no fuss resistors to use on a breadboard. You can just pop them in and they take a lot less space and time uh, than a bunch of through holes. So I wire up a little circuit to have an interrupt LED and an output LED, and then bust out ye oldie Arduino. Note that really old Duinos don't have dedicated SCL SDA pins and you have to use A4A5. Boy, all my stuff is dusty. Okay, so here's the final circuit, nothing too complicated. I whipped up some basic code using the simplest Arduino library I could find for the chip uh, to flash an output and then wait a while and read and spit out the 16-bit register. Flashing the LED works fine, and look at this. With this wire tied to ground, when I pull the I.O. pins low, you can see the interrupt go on and off. So the interrupt does work, but if you're not fast enough, you really can miss the change that caused it. Now, when I manage to hold the wire steady, the interrupt is cleared on that read. Underneath all that dust, you can see the read values changed as I hold one of the pins low. All right, I'm feeling confident now that the data sheet and functionality was well ingested and we can get down to business. First thing is that open drain, open question. Okay, I wanna know how we can have a pin that can act as an open drain. So on Wakwe here, we're going to create a super quick test. There are lots of different samples to use as starting points, but I want something quick and dirty and simple and to have a way to see some debug output. So we're just going to use this bare bones Arduino Nano sample. So I get a schematic with just the Nano and an empty sketch. I'm going to add a custom chip, call it open drain. I'll turn on the grid with G so everything snaps nicely. The default custom chip gives us uh, an in and out pin, which is just what we'll need. So that's great. Now, my idea is to use the in as control and the out as our open drain. So we can tie both of them to pretty much any pin in this example. Uh, I'll control the custom chip with D6. Now, for an open drain to work, we need a pull-up resistor. So there's a definite value uh, when the switch is open and it's floating. So let's add that. Hmm, give me some room here. Okay, I like my pull-ups to look that way, so rotate with R. Now I'll just pull up the VCC to get that. I like this walkway feature that if you start your wire on VCC, it's red. Now we pull up our test output. 
And that net is what we'll be monitoring from the uh, Arduino. So let's tie it to D3. Okay, just for completeness, I'm going to add power everywhere. Okay, so our test circuit is done. The chip output goes to three and the input to six. Okay, let's code it up, make a little room. So while it's running, we'll need access to our two pins, the input and the output. Our init creates an instance of that chip state for us. So let's in initialize the pins. To start with the output, we'll assume is floating on startup. So though it's called output, we init as an input here. The input is just an input. Uh, could use a pull up, whatever, that doesn't matter. Now we're gonna to wanna to keep an eye on the input and config out based on that. So let me go to the docs and get some boilerplate for watching the pins and copy paste that in. Okay, that looks good, but it's the input we wanna watch. Now we need that callback, so let me steal it from here. Now the callback doesn't know about the chip state structure, uh, so it just gets a void pointer, so I'm gonna cast that. Okay, you could just do everything here, but I like to separate callbacks from general purpose functions. Just gonna call process input with the chip uh, state struct. And let's define that. So here we want to look at the control input and set the output accordingly. If it's high, we'll set the output pin mode low. Uh, the switch is closed, the drain is draining. Otherwise the pin is floating. Uh, so an input, great, we should be done here. Now the driver code. So in the sketch, we have these two pins of interest, uh, six and three. I like to find to give us some decent names. So the open drain output is three, the control is six, Set this up. We're gonna be looking at the custom chip output. So this pin is an input and the control is an output. Let's start it off with a known value and start up the serial output so we can get feedback on this side too. In the main loop, just going to turn the drain on and off and uh, look what comes out. So write the control. Let's create a little function to dump out a status report. So let's wait a bit, then repeat all that, but with the control pin flipped. Okay, let's try this out. Hum. That's not working out. Uh, okay, stop. Okay, I really am setting control high than low. Okay, I really am setting the output pin low than floating. What's the chip say? Floating, floating, floating. So pin read input is never true. <laughs> the dangers of copy paste. I don't just want to look at falling. I want to get triggered on both falling and rising. So if I run this, ha, <laughs> ha, Okay, that test is conclusive. We really can set up an open drain output this way and the pull-up resistor uh, will work and everything behaves nicely. Okay, that's good. We really can have a pin that is either output low or floating, meaning configured as an input with no pull-up or pull-down, and it behaves as we expect. So we're good to go. Now let's start by creating the custom chip's physical layout and finalize what the test circuit will look like. Okay, we'll create another Arduino Nano project and create a custom chip for our PCF8575. Now we have to mirror the pins from the actual device. Just need to take the data sheet and enter the pins in the order specified. So VCC is the last pin and now we have a nice physical layout that matches the physical chip. All right, grid on, let's start wiring up. Now it's nicely laid out such that the port zero pins are all on the left and port one on the right. So we'll just go left to right input to output. For the inputs, a uh, dip switch will do nicely. We can just line it up and feed switch one to pin one, etc., etc. Since these inputs are all pulled up, uh, all we need is to either pull to ground or leave the switch open to set our inputs. So when one of these switches is on, the pin will read as low. Let's wire all these up. Okay, now for the outputs. Let's just use some LEDs. Now, when we mirror the inputs onto the outputs on the left, an on switch will go low. So we'll put a pull up on the LED. If the switch is open, the input is high, uh, the output will then be high and the LED will be off. Uh, with the switch closed, that input will be pulled low and the LED will be on. All right, clean this up a bit. Notice that pin zero on the first port is up top, whereas it's down on the bottom of the chip at the, on the output side there. So we're gonna have some ugly wiring if I want the top switch to toggle the top LED. C'est la vie. Uh, okay, let me wire this up. Okay, make this yellow. Now uh, we have all our inputs and outputs done. I'll just power the chip, not required, but uh, you know, for completeness. To test the addresses, let's just use uh, slide switches to set uh, to zero or one. Okay, this will be for bits one and two, lazy I know. Now I'll give the switch uh, the option to set the bits low or high. Okay, a second switch for address bit zero, same deal, high or low, both switches set to zero to start. Okay, I need a little space uh, to get the I squared C lines out. And make it blue. Okay, all that's left is the interrupt. Uh, needs to be pulled up, put a resistor next to it, has some power, and now it's pulled up. And I want to monitor this on the Arduino, so tie that to good old uh, D3. Finally, as a debug output, I'll have a LED driven by the Arduino on some random pin. Uh, resistor, optional here, but good habit, and a LED. 
Let's make it blue and complete the circuit. There. After a little cleanup, we have eight inputs that will mirror on the outputs. We've got switches for these rest bits, the I squared C lines, the interrupt line is pulled up and can be sensed, uh, and there's a LED output. Looks good. Great. We have a nice circuit where the idea is to keep an eye on the interrupt and mirror any changes on the inputs to what we've decided are the outputs. And we've got some stub files for both the Arduino and the custom chip. These are completely independent, so we could start with either, but my focus is on the custom chip, so let's get into that. Now it's time to implement the chip's functionality. Let me make a little room here and grow the font. Let's start basic and get a place to store the pins we will be playing with. I like to define things that are numeric so they actually have meaning and there's only one place to change if need be. So we're going to have an address configured by the address bits. We'll also have the interrupt pin calling it n int to highlight that it's active low and um, the 16 GPIO. Now this chip is all about I squared C so a peek at the docs tells us that like spy and everything there'll be an init call uh, to set it up and there's a configuration struct and four callbacks though disconnect uh, isn't required. So the config has a few parts, including the address uh, that's set up by those pins there. Now, I don't know if the Walkway I squared C can handle the address pins uh, changing dynamically, meaning after power up. Uh, and I don't even know if the, uh, the chip does. But since they may, I think I'm going to stash I squared C stuff in the chip state struct uh, so we can, in theory, play with them down the line in callbacks or whatever. I'm going to hold on to the device, the I squared C config. And since we know that our I2C transactions will always be two bytes, uh, port zero, then port one, I'm going to add an I2C port count to keep track of where we are during reads and writes. So the init. We're going to make little loops to init our pins and uh, we need the names here. The address pins A012. So the IO pin names are part PNM for port N pin M. So I'm just going to make a big list of those names too. Okay, we're going to want to watch at least some of these guys. Let's get our boilerplate from the docs here. Okay, though this may be for nothing, let's watch the address pins. I'm going to name the callback chip address change. Now loop over each address bit to init as an input and watch it according to our config. Hmm, rename that to something more specific. All right, for the I.O. pins. Hmm, with the I2C and all that, this init is going to get big. I'm going to add a function here. Okay, the I.O. These things start up as inputs, but they won't necessarily stay that way. Uh, they can be inputs or outputs. We should only watch those set up as inputs, and we also need to keep track of whether the read value is different than the last read value, because in those cases, the interrupt will be asserted. So I'm adding these three 16-bit members to the structure. The mask tells us which bits can be inputs, the value is whatever the current state of the input is, and the last read value is just that, uh, and will tell us if we should interrupt. So we're going to start setting up the I2C. We need to construct the address based on the A bits there, and the base address. Let's set the same default. On power up, we have everything high, so everything is an input, and the value is all ones. The port count is our transmit byte tracker, so set that to zero. Oh, and the watch config. Which of the I.O. pins we watch will change depending on the user. So let's stick that in our chip state struct so we can reuse it when we need it. All right, so this I.O. pin watch config needs to report on both edges. We want pin changes to go somewhere, call it chip input I.O. change. And that user data is, as always, our chip struct. I2C. Oh, let me make a stub for the watch callback and the address callback. Okay, I2C configuration. Let's save some typing by getting a pointer to the thing we stuck in the chip state struct. Now, here's the stuff we need to set in there. The SCL and SDA pins need initializing. I'm using pull-ups here, not sure we should do this. Okay, let's just reuse the names from the boilerplate for the I2C callbacks. That looks good. Maybe I should make sure I call that so the stuff actually happens. I reuse the callback names so I can just get these and paste them in. All right, back to I.O. So we'll do another loop over each I.O. pin to do the initialization. Everything starts out as input pull-up. That means everything is watched also. So pin watch uh, with that config we set up before. Now, during startup, we should configure our address as per the pin settings. I'll create a read address function for this. All we need to do here is read the address bits, which form the least significant bits of the actual address. So loop over those, and if it reads high, then that LSB is one. The configured address is therefore an OR of the base address and the three LSBs. Just gonna output some debug here and return the actual value. Now, we can get that configured address, finish the I2C config. I guess we don't really need this in two places. Whatever. So all the I2C dev config is done, and we can call its init with that. And print out a little more debug, because it never hurts. Well, 
within reason. Okay, finally, I want to make sure we start with uh, interrupt clear. This will be happening in other places, so let's give ourselves a utility function. Put it up here, distinct functions for on and off, just to make it super clear. The on version actually brings that pin low. We can spit out a notification when it happens. Okay, the basics are set up. Now the actual I2C stuff. We need to fill out these functions. Let's start with the easiest, which is I2C read. So we need our chip state. Uh, we'll need to do this a lot, so let's just make it a macro to get the chip state from the user data void pointer there. Now we have a chip pointer with our state. So the return value is just one byte, and it needs to be the current value of all inputs read. This is uh, low byte, then high byte, which is why we're tracking the port count. When port count is zero, this shift does nothing. When it's one, it shifts the high bit down by eight bits. So that port count needs to be tracked for every byte read. We just make it a utility function. Now this could be done with a modulo and it's what I'd do if it were more than two bytes, but here I'm gonna make it super clear. It's either zero or one, the end. Okay, so after incrementing the port count for the possible subsequent read, we just return our value and we're done with the read callback. Next, connection. And the only mandatory job here is to make sure we start our port count at zero. And even that's not necessary if uh, the clients are well behaved, because uh, multiples of two would just loop us around to zero. But never assume clients are well behaved. So this shouldn't happen, but I'm going to spit out a message if the address uh, the connect gives us isn't the address we think we have. So a new connection, port count goes to zero as mentioned. Does this only apply to reads? I can't remember, but let's pretend. So if this is a read, we'll remember that the other side has seen this current reported value and deassert the interrupt. Okay, almost done. Let's receive a write from the remote side. Get our chip state, of course. Now, if the port count is zero, this is the first of a pair of bytes. So let's set everything as output low by default. Now we loop over every bit we've received. Each bit represents one pin on one port, and that depends on the port count. So the absolute 16-bit index of this particular bit is the bit in this byte, plus maybe eight if it's the second byte. Well, let's get a handle to this pin to save some typing. Let's always stop watching this pin. Uh, it has no effect if we were watching it anyway. If this bit was set as one, then this is being configured as high out uh, slash input. Keep track of that in the input mask, set the mode to input pull up, and watch the pin using our previous config. Otherwise, this is a output low. Simple, set the pin mode. Okay, if this was the second byte, uh, just going to output a bit of debug here. Also need to increment that port count regardless of anything. Okay, let's try this out, see how many mistakes we have. Yeah, okay, semicolon. There. That looks good. Now you can only change the switches while it's running, uh, but they stay that way. So restart. And look at that, the address has changed. Okay, that's cool. Anything left? Ah, les to-dos. So not doing anything yet on our uh, watch callbacks. Uh, for the address change, I don't think we'll do anything here with I squared C, but we'll still read in the address as configured and just spit out a little message. Okay, chip IO change. Here we need to act. So get chip state. Let's get the current input value. Just going to put this out into another function. Our other job is to notify the user on change. So if the input value isn't equal to the last value read in, interrupt flag goes on. Otherwise, though this may mean the event is missed, interrupt flag goes off. Okay, actually reading the inputs. So we're only gonna try and read the value of any pin that is actually configured as an input. This will be returned as a 16-bit value. Start by assuming it's just zero then loop over all the GPIO. If it's set up as an input with the matching bit actually a non-zero, then if when we read the pin it's high, then the corresponding bit of the return value gets turned on uh, with an or equal there. And we return that. Let's try and run that. Mm, no obvious mistakes. Now in theory, we have our custom chip done. Let's try it out, first with some basic tests and then the whole shebang. Right. On the driver side. So first thing is that I'm gonna use the library that uh, I use in my physical test because it's dead simple and just lets you read or write 16-bit values and deal with the rest. Okay, in the sketch, let's include that lib. Now pin three is the interrupt and 10 is the debug led, so I can define these. Let's also put in the address bits uh, settings we expect to create the device instance as a, just a global. Now we're gonna be attaching an interrupt and the ISR's job will just be to set a flag. 
So we call it the volatile bool because it's being twiddled in the interrupt routine and create that routine as PCF int. And in here, just set the flag true. So set up, let's turn on I2C. Let's also turn on the serial for some debug output. Weirdly with this library, it flips all the bits by default and I don't want that. Now our two pins, the interrupt pin we'll look at. So it needs to be an input. The LED output is an output, okay. Now let's just flash a LED on startup. So I define a little function that you can say flash uh, five times. It'll just loop and do writes to the device. So here I'm gonna start with uh, P17 low, wait a bit, and then set P17, well, all bits high. Okay, after flashing, I want uh, the input side as inputs and output side as high, so uh, the LEDs are off. Finally, let's attach that interrupt routine. I want it on the right pin. I want it to call PCF int and do so whenever that falls. Let's wait a second and uh, there, clear the interrupt by reading the inputs and mirroring them on the outputs with this uh, to be defined function. Okay, how does mirror input onto output work? So we need to get the value by doing a read on the device. I'm gonna create a get changed input value for no particular reason, but may use it later. And this does a read and return the ports value. Now the inputs are port zero, so that's the low byte of the 16-bit value returned. I want to write that red value to the outputs. So I construct a new 16-bit value, but make sure I have the low byte set to all ones so that the inputs stay configured as inputs. And we write the actual value back to the device. Okay, the main loop is going to be nothing but looking at the uh, have interrupt flag there. If we do, we clear it, turn on our debug LED and mirror the inputs to the outputs. Otherwise, we just turn off the debug LED. And so we can see that LED and maybe spare our CPU a bit. Let's add a delay. Okay, what's this look like if we try to run it? Oh, oops. Ah, yes. Oops, <laughs> bad paste. I meant get change input value. Okay, go. Hmm. I don't see the lead. Nothing is happening. Hold on, let me clear this. Okay, the chip is seeing the changes, but nothing's happening. Uh, give me a sec. Okay, I made two pretty awful mistakes. <laughs> Unrelated to the bug in the I2C write, I have the increment port count and return inside the 8-bit for loop there. <laughs> That's not good. But the main thing is that with all the back and forth, look at this. I'm playing with the int pin mode, but it's never initialized. Oops. So let's do that just in it as an input and starter up. Oh, look at the LED flash. And now the inputs are mirrored. That looks good. If I change the address bits, it stops working. But if I then match the code to the settings, it works. And the debug LED flashes on each interrupt as expected. Whew. Okay, cool. So I'll clean up my uh, debug cookie crumbs there and it'll be available for you to play with if you like. All right, that's a custom chip from A to Z. Now let me know if you liked it, if you have any questions and also what you'd like to see next. Maybe something on using an interactive debugger, Visual Studio integration, maybe CI and GitHub actions with Walkwe, or just something more basic about using Walkwe or anything else. Let us know what you're most curious about and we can surely prepare something useful. Until then, hope you enjoyed. Thanks for watching. Cheers.